Well, good afternoon, my friends, and as you've just been told, my name is Father Eamon Power from the Diocese of Brentwood, and specifically St. Teresa's in Newbury Park. And I'm happy for the opportunity to be with you once again for your day with Mary. I have been coming here a few years now, and we also have our own day with Mary in my home parish of Newbury Park next Saturday. So, amongst other things, it means I'd better think of something, something new to say between now and then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I was explaining to the members of our prayer group the origin of the name we have ascribed to it, namely Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit. And the reason is that, as a charismatic prayer group, we wish also to be full of the Holy Spirit, that great gift of the very life of God, the breath of God who is poured into us at the moment of our baptism and strengthened whenever we receive the Eucharistic gift of God when we receive Holy Communion in a good state of grace. So why is Our Lady the spouse of the Holy Spirit? It is, of course, a major source of contention with our friends from the non-Catholic Christian traditions. So how can we justify it? If we are looking for justification from the Holy Scriptures, then perhaps there's no better place to start than with the Gospel of St. Luke. So let us take that as our starting point. When Mary asked the angel how it could be that she would bear a son since she was a virgin, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. This short scriptural passage has a great deal of meaning and wide-ranging implications for understanding God's gift to Mary as the mother of the Messiah. First Mary received the Holy Spirit. You might say she was baptized or immersed, soaked in the Holy Spirit and therefore the gift of the Holy Spirit was made available to her in a most special and unique way. And this allowed her to exercise or to use this gift according to the will of God. More precisely, the Holy Spirit in the fullness of his power was able to move Mary to perfectly accomplish the will of God the Father. The second point is that when we read the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. We see in this passage a reference connecting various Old Testaments and apocalyptic scriptures. In Exodus chapter 24, we read that the cloud covered the mountain where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and his glory settled on Sinai. The cloud also covered the tent of meeting in Exodus chapter 40 and no one was able to enter because the glory of God filled the tabernacle. Similarly, in the first book of the Kings, when the priests had, had dedicated the new temple, the cloud again filled the temple and no one was able to enter. The word shadow in Luke chapter 1 implies cloud and thus suggests that Mary, like the temple, tent, house or tabernacle of the old covenant, becomes the dwelling place of God, signalling the beginning of the new covenant. We can see from this overshadowing by God that Mary became the chosen, chosen temple of God and that the glory of God filled her such that Mary was able to say, God has done great things for me. A second implication of God's overshadowing of Mary is its symbolic connection to that of a husband overshadowing his wife uh, to consummate his marriage with her. The Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary should it certainly not be understood as a, as a physical action, but more as a spiritual act. And this coupled with the implications of scripture in 1 Kings chapter 8, in which no one was able to enter the tabernacle when the cloud of God was present, indicates that Mary too uh, could belong to no other person but to God alone. She was, in a sense, married to God, espoused to God. The overshadowing of Mary by the Most High God also reminds us 
of the Spirit hovering over the waters in chapter 1 of Genesis prior to the creation. In Mary's case, God was at creating a home for himself in the womb of Mary, a human body, Emmanuel, God with us, God for us. This work of creation by God in Genesis ended with the creation of man, the first Adam. The move of the Holy Spirit over Mary ended with the creation of the body of the new Adam, Jesus, God in flesh. Mary, being overshadowed by the Most High, predates, or is at least uh, coincidental with the conception of Jesus, the God-man. In this, the Holy Spirit consummates the union of him and Mary. He becomes the spouse of Mary. Since God expects spouses to remain together until death, it is reasonable for us to assume that this breathtaking relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit that produced the God-man must have continued at least through her earthly life and likely in some way even in heaven itself. Once Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit as a result of her saying, let it be done, something more was required for Jesus to be conceived and that was Mary's faith. That was the final piece necessary for the miracle to take place. Mary had to believe that it could be done. She had to believe that nothing was impossible for God, as the angel had said to her. It is Mary's faith that makes her the queen of prophets and, miracle, and miracles. Her faith, in fact, is so significant from a number of different perspectives that it cannot be pondered often enough. Human words themselves are inadequate to describe this truth and require the action and inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the soul of the hearer in order for its profound gravity to emerge. Let us consider the example of the prophets of God once again. If a prophet is moved by the Spirit of God, he must yield to the Spirit to speak the word of God. If he never opened his mouth, no prophecy will be made. Mary's fiat, or let it be done, implies active desire that God's will be done in her. However, more than this was required for Jesus to be conceived. And this can be understood from Elizabeth's words to Mary, blessed is she who believed. Mary's believing faith was so complete that as a prophet speaks the word of the Lord, she brought forth the word of God from heaven to her own body and to the world. And thereby Mary became the fruitful virgin, spouse of the Holy Spirit. As Saint Louis Marie de Montfort says, the Holy Spirit, who was barren in God, that is, he did not beget another person, becomes fruitful in Mary in bringing forth the bodily incarnation of the second person of the Holy Trinity. Jesus said in the Gospel that if one were to have the faith the size of a mustard seed, one could move a mountain. That's from Matthew chapter 17. To bring about the incarnation of the eternal Word of God, Mary's faith must have been more like a fully grown cedar of Lebanon than a tiny mustard seed. This faith of Mary's was planted by God, nurtured and fulfilled by the Holy Spirit. It is the pivotal gift in God's plan of redemption in Mary's maternity, in her espousement to the Holy Spirit, and this leads her to become the co-redemptrix and the mediatrix of all graces. And key to Mary's relationship to the Holy Spirit is that her faith, in a sense, consummates the relationship and brings forth the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word of God made flesh. In the Trinity, the Father is fruitful and begets the Son, and the Father and the Son are fruitful and beget the Spirit. In Mary, his spouse, by the faith which he inspired, the Holy Spirit became fruitful and begets the incarnation of the Word of God. This is a great and a glorious mystery that deserves 
uh, contemplation deserves to be prayed about. It is a pearl of great price, much greater than the one that the merchant sold all he had to purchase. The wise follower of Jesus desires to comprehend God through this mystery. The special presence of the Holy Spirit over Mary, as we've described, did not cease with the conception of Jesus. Upon learning from the angel that her relative Elizabeth was expectant with the precursor of the Messiah, John the Baptist, Mary went to visit her. At hearing Mary's greeting, her cousin Elizabeth was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and she, and she prophesied. And this is reminiscent of Numbers chapter 11 when the cloud was over the temple of meeting and the 72 elders received some of the Spirit of God, some of the Spirit that God had given to Moses. In this case it is Elizabeth who receives the Spirit and prophesies. It also indicates the Spirit was still overshadowing Mary like the cloud over the tent of meeting. In fact, throughout the history of the church, whenever the mother of Jesus appeared in, and in some way spoke to the people, such as, for instance, Lourdes uh, in, in 1858 and Fatima in 1917 and so forth, the people were filled with the Holy Spirit. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, the first fruit is repentance, that is a recognition of one's sinfulness and a desire to change or reform one's life. A good example of this is the apparition and the miraculous image of Mary given in Mexico City in 1531, which in a few years led to the conversion of eight million Aboriginal people to the Christian faith. Just looking at the miraculous image, these people were filled with the Holy Spirit and asked for baptism. In a similar way, the fetal John within the womb of Elizabeth also received the Spirit as he leapt for joy at the presence of the Messiah and his mother. The sanctification of John the Baptist in the Holy Spirit through the presence of Mary can be seen as the beginning of John's mission to bear witness to the Saviour. In her response to the impulse of the Holy Spirit to visit Elizabeth, Mary was acting as his instrument to fulfil the words of the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel had said to Zechariah, and he, was, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. In a sense, the Holy Spirit was using Mary as his physical temple to carry out his work. In other words, Mary could be seen as the hands, feet and voice of the Holy Spirit in his sanctification of John. Since with God all things are possible, the Holy Spirit could have found other means to sanctify John in the womb, but God's choice was to use Mary as his instrument. In this we can see Mary as the one totally docile to the Holy Spirit, totally at his disposal, and as such she is an example to us all. Mary's relationship with the Holy Spirit is evident in the faith she had that Jesus would remedy the problem with the wine at the wedding feast at Cana. She was so intimately in touch with the Holy Spirit that she knew it was indeed the hour to ask Jesus to begin his public ministry, even though he protested it wasn't the time. These words witnessed in a general way to the, messian to the messianic role of Jesus when Mary said, do whatever he tells you. And that's what Our Lady asks of us, my friends, that we do exactly whatever it is that her Son tells us to do by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. To achieve this, we need the prayers and the loving intercession of Mary, forever the spouse of the Holy Spirit and the holy channel through which his power flows into us. So Lent is now so close, my friends, and as it is so close, let us ask Mary, our mother, to obtain for each of us a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we may be healed and renewed and strengthened in faith as we continue in this journey through life. 
So I'll just pray briefly. Come, O Holy Spirit, come, Lord, we pray, and come by means of the gracious and powerful intercession of, Mary, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> So hopefully I might see some of you next week, my friends, in my own parish of St. Teresa's in Newbury Park. <laughs>